Funding for the Hinckley Report is made possible in part by the George S. and Dolores Dore Eccles Foundation and the Cleone Peterson Eccles Endowment Fund. Tonight on the Hinckley Report, following an intense primary season, voters chose the final candidates for critical roles in Utah's state and national elections. Utah's legislature continues to tackle tough issues as the state grapples with the impacts of COVID-19. And the final slate is set as Utah prepares to host the vice presidential debate in October in what is sure to be a historic election. Good evening and welcome to The Hinckley Report. I'm Jason Perry, director of the Hinckley Institute of Politics. Covering the week, we have Lisa Riley Roche, reporter with the Deseret News, Glenn Mills, anchor and senior political correspondent with ABC4 Utah, and Jennifer Napier Pierce, former editor of the Salt Lake Tribune. So glad to have you all here today. I've missed you over the summer. It's been a long summer. It has. It feels even longer <laughs> than it my, was. <laughs> and my, how things have changed. I'm sitting in my living room talking to you on the Hinkley Report. This I know. Morning. We have, are nothing but innovative. And what's also interesting, politics did not stop for a single second. We have so much to get into today because it's all interesting and it's all continuing. Jennifer, I want to start with you for just a moment about the primary. We just had the primary. We know the results and I want to talk about the results only a little bit, but some of the key issues that came up still are happening today and we're going to see all the way through November. Let's talk about one of those issues and it's the 70 plus thousand newly ment minted members of the Utah Republican Party. Uh, the people who affiliated, talk about that en enormous shift that happened, because that was a record in terms of the people affiliating for the the primary. Well, of course, the largest party affiliation in Utah has always been unaffiliated. So now if you want to vote in the Republican primary, you have to declare some sort of allegiance. And we saw people really invested in this race. There were four very strong candidates. People wanted a, uh, a choice, and so people were willing to make a little switch, even if it's a temporary switch. 70,000 is really significant. I think anything that encourages people to get out and express their their political preferences, that's that's a very healthy sign. Yeah, so so Glenn, it's just so interesting to, to see how people did affiliate. I mean, a lot of people think that there's just a bunch of Republicans, and there are a lot of them in the state of Utah, but this unaffiliated category seems to be a group that really influenced this particular the primary. Yeah, no doubt about it. We figure there were somewhere around 45,000 if you take a look at the numbers from the beginning of May uh, up until the primary election of the a, of a unaffiliated who went down and Republican numbers that went up. But we also saw a pretty significant number of Democrats. We figure somewhere around 10,000 wanting to make sure they had a voice in this race as well. And they jumped in and uh, voted. And when you take a look at the results, I mean, this thing finished between uh, Lieutenant Governor Spencer Cox and former Governor John Huntsman Jr. within one percentage point. So when you take a look at that number of voters that got in there, they really did have an impact on this election. They certainly did. Go ahead, Lisa. I was gonna say, let's not forget there was a lot of encouragement this election cycle for voters to register as Republican and participate in the governor's uh, GOP primary specifically. Uh, you had a former Utah Democratic Party chairman, Jim DeBacchus, openly announcing he had registered as a Republican, encouraging others to do so. Uh, former Governor Huntsman's campaign advertised on social media and elsewhere, reminding people you can't vote in this governor's primary unless you're a registered Republican. Uh, a lot of the Democrats I talked to about making that switch said they felt like they wanted to have a voice in who the next governor was, and this was the only way they felt they could do it. There were a, a, a wide range of candidates in the governor's race on the political spectrum from uh, relatively moderate, uh, I'm thinking Governor Huntsman, uh, a little less so uh, Lieutenant Governor Cox, and then of course, uh, very conservative former House Speaker Greg Hughes and uh, former Utah GOP Chairman. Uh, Thomas Wright. Thomas Wright, yeah. yes, thank you. How, how quickly we forget. 
<laughs> but with that wide range, a lot of people who consider themselves moderate, independent Democrats felt like there was a chance there could be a real conservative in there that wouldn't represent them as well. Well, I'm curious. So, Glenn, because I want to get your analysis on this, Jim, but this is just an interesting point. Uh, when the Democrats, so particularly like Jim DeBacca, said, we want you all to affiliate, we want to have a voice in the GOP race, um, they didn't exactly say who to vote for. I'm kind of curious if you saw in any of those numbers, did, did they vote for who the people thought they would? Uh, did they have that particular impact once they affiliated? Well, one thing I was going to bring up, in addition to what Lisa said, is we also saw some endorsements that you may not have expected. For example, Equality Utah. They came out and endorsed John Huntsman Jr. as a Republican candidate, and they made that endorsement that would have uh, gone through November as well had he uh, won the primary election on the Republican side. So I think endorsements like that also had a role in it, and I do think that those voters um, from what I heard, a lot of them said they would have been happy with Huntsman or Lieutenant Governor Cox. And so I don't know specifically that they really went for Huntsman as much as we thought they were going to coming into the primary. Mm. What kind of impact did this have, uh, Jennifer? Because uh, it seemed to, like, like it diffused really among all these candidates, with with, with none of them getting uh, over a, over a, over a majority for sure. You know, thirty seven percent seems to be as high as we got. So how did that get diffused? Well, I, I think that any time that you have a plurality. There's, there's, it raises a lot of questions. You know, I think that when you are not seeing clear majorities, does that person have a mandate going forward? I think that's going to be a question that lingers for Lieutenant Governor Cox. Um, you know, he did edge out everybody else, but he only got 37 or 36. Yeah. And, you know, that, that does raise some questions about uh, what's going to happen in November. Yeah, so, so how does that play out with the people you're talking to? Because I know you've covered this story a lot. So he's almost 37%, which means 63% of the people affiliated as Republicans voted for someone else. You know, how does that play into this if it's maybe not a mandate? I guess that's what you're saying. It's not necessarily a mandate, but how does Spencer Cox really approach that then when he's really got to win all over the rest of those people? Can he? Are they really going to go anywhere else? Or Well, what other choices are there? Perhaps former governor John oh. Huntsman will be doing this uh, uh, writing campaign that seems to be all the buzz this week. Um, just based on recent poll numbers, I don't think the Democrat Chris Peterson has much traction, at least yet. He may pick up a few points, but um, realistically, Spencer Cox's this is a race for him to lose. So it'll be really interesting to see what could tip the balance on, on in the Huntsman camp. Um, he's certainly flirting with the idea, for sure. Yeah, I'm so curious. Lisa, you, you well, talked to him about it. Well, I, I've talked to him about it, and he didn't have a whole lot to say other than he's still in the position of not uh, pursuing this. Even though there are there is a group that's doing some polling and some other things, he hasn't met with them. They uh, are still pulling their their information together, but they only have an, until August 31st. What I'm hearing from people close to the governor is that a couple things would have to happen, or one of two things would have to happen, probably. One would be there'd have to be some serious election irregularities that would call into question the results. And we haven't really seen that. There, there were some issues with some of the ballots being printed with the wrong date to submit them, for example. But I, I don't think there's anything serious enough on that level. The other piece that I think would force him to seriously consider this is what happens with the examination of how the state handled COVID-19. Remember, Lieutenant Governor Cox was the leader of the state's response uh, through much of the primary until he got a lot of political pressure and then sort of stepped back. Uh, so if we get that audit that's being done by the state auditor before August 31st and it shows some serious irregularities, that could be enough to force the governor in. But there's no guarantee that audit will be done uh, before the deadline to file as a write-in candidate comes. And remember in Utah, you can't just uh, mount a writing campaign on behalf of a candidate. The candidate himself or herself has to go in and file as a write-in for those votes to be counted in November. Mm -hmm. 
Go ahead, Glenn. Jason, just one point I wanted to bring up real quick. And when we talk about uh, Spencer Cox kind of um, mending relationships and winning over that other 64 or 63%, from what I'm seeing, it seems like the Utah GOP and Chair Derek Brown is the one who's really trying to work on that. He's the one reaching out to uh, other candidates in the race and trying to get them behind Spencer Cox. And you know, you see their social media reaching out to members of the party saying, we need to get behind our candidate. So it's been interesting to see that most of that effort from my uh, point of view, from what I'm seeing is actually coming from the party rather than the candidate. Mm -hmm. So well, interesting. Cox has been, sorry, Cox has been really low key since the primary. I, I did a story recently. His campaign doesn't expect to even do much of anything until after Labor Day, which is the traditional start of campaigning, of course, but this isn't a traditional year. And he does still have a role in COVID-19 uh, response by the state and is anticipated to take an even larger role going forward again. So I, th I think people do want to see and hear from him. And, and to Glenn's point, it is interesting that he's not the one leading out on kind of repairing some of those relationships and, and bringing on board some of those voters from the primary who went with other candidates. I think you're right, Lisa. I mean, uh, this is a very unusual year. Candidates usually step back in the summer and then they start to really put their efforts after Labor Day. Um, but candidates have to can start campaigning now because the campaign style has fundamentally changed. I mean, you can't go out and, you know, glad hand people. There's not parades, all the sort of traditional campaign activities um, are all virtual. It's just a different dynamic. And um, I, I'll, I'll be very interested to see how the strategy works. I mean, it doesn't seem like business as usual is really the smartest tack to take right now. Do you think that uh, the Lieutenant Governor is going to take a stronger hand after Labor Day and uh, in the COVID response? It's it's really going to be interesting to watch. I mean, his opponents hammered him yeah. on that, saying that he politicized it, that he should not have been out there using it as uh, stump speeches. And so he really has withdrawn. Um, that's been noticeable. On the other hand, uh, whoever is the governor is going to really have to dig down in COVID response. Response. I mean, this isn't going away before Election Day. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think voters are going to demand some answers about missteps uh, through the spring and into uh, the summer uh, on the state's side, but also what is the plan going forward? Yeah, right. Right. Uh, one more thing I want to talk about from this primary. Glenn, if you don't mind. So this was a record amount of turnout in the state. For this primary, you know, it blew the old records away in terms of participation. One of those key elements of that, you can talk about that for just a moment too, but one of the key factors there was, was mail-in ballots. Uh, every Utah was able to send in a ballot by mail if they wanted to. Talk about that impact, particularly given the backdrop that some, maybe even President Trump, are not so thrilled about mail-in balloting. Yeah, let's talk about the turnout first because nobody saw this coming. When you take a look at 2016, we more than doubled the turnout in the gubernatorial race. And even campaigns kind of struggled with that in, in their polling. And some thought they were going to do a little bit better than they did, but they were modeling it off tops maybe 360,000. We had almost 530,000 people vote in the Republican primary gubernatorial race. That is unbelievable. You go back to 2018, there were about 318,000 ballots cast. So turnout was incredible. And it was this race that just had so many different dynamics and storylines that really drove that, in my opinion. Now to the mail-in ballot portion. Utah was in a unique position to capitalize on the need to do that from the beginning because we've been doing that for a while. It's uh, something that uh, Lieutenant Governor Spencer Cox, a Republican, has said we've had great success in doing. Other Republicans are on board that as well. So there's a different tone with the Republican Party here in the state of Utah on mail-in balloting than what we are seeing nationwide. And a lot of Utahns like the convenience of it. It comes right to your home. You have an opportunity to really get into it and, and search and research what you want to do, fill it out, and just drop it back in the mail. So it's been... Uh, very successful here in the state of Utah, and a lot of people are behind it.
I think the rhetoric coming out of the White House is really going to test this because um, are people seeing this po issue politicized the way that masks have been politicized? You know, I, d I do think that um, it, this might turn into an allegiance to, uh, to President Trump in uh, a similar way. And I, it, it's very interesting to see Governor Herbert stand clearly behind mail-in ballots as a, a valid form of expression. Um, but will we start to see some fissures? Will we see some cracks on the the Trump loyalist front here in Utah? It'll be really intriguing. It, w it will be. Can't wait to watch that play out. Lisa, do you have a comment on that? I, I was going to say, uh, in the primary, because of COVID, the state legislature made some changes to by mail voting. We've had by mail voting or a version of it for, for a long time now in Utah, but we've also always had options for early voting in person as well as uh, election day voting in person. However, this time uh, all of that was taken off the table and people were expected to vote by mail only. Uh, there, w there was a setup uh, that some counties took advantage of. They called it drive-through voting. But technically what you did is you drove through, got whatever information you needed, got a new ballot if that's what you needed, and then you had to fill it out and drop it off yourself somewhere else. We're going to see next week in the special session some changes to the November election that will restore some of that flexibility to counties to allow in-person voting. To Jennifer's point about Trump loyalty, it'll be interesting to see how many people actually decide, okay, I'm going to fill out my mail-in ballot and then I'm going to deliver it in person or I'm going to go in person and demand to see a, a separate ballot. Uh, there was only a few thousand people overall, I was told, that voted in person. And remember, there were a few exceptions, uh, people with disabilities, for example. Uh, Mm -hmm. That's that's right. Can I, let's follow this thread a little bit too, Jennifer, because uh, we we do have a special session coming up. Uh, we think it's going to be uh, on the twentieth. A uh, couple of questions about that. One is uh, we call it a special session. Can, can we call it special anymore? This is number six, right? The sixth special session they've had, which is wrapped around these COVID issues. So my question for you is this: uh, Who's going to call it? Who's going to call the session? The governor or the legislature? Very interesting question. I, I'm not sure. Um, I do think that uh, the governor has reason to call it, but he may take uh, let the legislature take the lead on this. Whoever calls the session, of course, sets the agenda. So um, it is a, a big decision. Um, they have some real things to talk about. So um, I, I wouldn't be surprised if the legislature steps forward on this one. Mm -hmm. Glenn, how is the governor's office and the legislature been working on these on these sessions? Because there's been a lot to discuss and there are some restrictions on what the legislature can do when they call themselves into session. Talk about what you're hearing in that in that regard. Yeah, uh, to your point about are these special sessions anymore? Probably not. We should just call this general session dash six at this point, right? <laughs> but, uh, you know, there's always been this kind of power struggle between the legislature and the governor's office. And in fact, we've seen that as a, as a result that the legislature can now call themselves into special session. That's something new. Uh, we've seen them in the past special sessions mostly addressing, you know, budget issues because of the impact of COVID-19. But there have been also some of these power struggle issues that we've seen as well. The legislature didn't like the governor going out and making all these special rules. Uh, due to the COVID-19, and so then they came up with this compromise where he has to run it by them first and give them a certain amount of time to uh, respond or react to it. And so there has kind of been that power struggle. And we, we've seen it all along, though. That's nothing new. But we've certainly seen it play out in the COVID-19 uh, arena as well. And like Jennifer says, at this point, we don't know who's going to call this and who will run the agenda. Mm -hmm. uh, Lisa, one thing that we're, we're seeing in this special session that's coming, but all that we've seen going forward too, is there's this underlying theme of uh, what is the right approach to uh, the pandemic? I'm kind of curious because it seems like there's a, there's a couple of ways to get to this. There's the, the health aspects, but it seems like politics seems to be being maybe the biggest hand that's at play in the response for the state. Well, I think uh, legislative leadership would suggest it's more of a barbell approach weighted equally on both sides. One side is healthcare and the other side is economic recovery. 
And so I, I don't think they would say politics figures into that, but of course it figures into both responses. On, on the health side, a mask mandate is, is clearly a political issue in, in Utah. Going back to the uh, the governor's race and uh, how, what kind of role the lieutenant governor will play in the COVID response going forward, you, you have to look at that mask mandate. Governor Herbert's been reluctant to do that. He has set these goals for the state to meet in terms of caseload, and uh, the state's been able to meet those and avoid the statewide mask mandate. But Lieutenant Governor Cox has refused to say where he what he would do if he were governor, if it, when it comes to ordering Utahns to wear a mask, which health experts will tell you would dramatically lower the cases that we we see, the spread of this disease, because of course a, man, a mask protects you from spreading your germs to others. So, so, so Glenn, when, can I ask about? Uh, I'm sorry, Lisa. No, no, that that's okay. Go well, ahead. Because I want to follow up on on your really great thought about that. Because we got to get to this mask mandate. What you just said is exactly right. You got the health part about it, but you also got the politics of it. Uh, we just did a a poll recently where we asked Utahns about those masks. And Glenn, this was how it broke down. Forty one percent of Utahns said they were comfortable going outside without a mask right now. Forty four percent not comfortable. 15% unsure. And as you start looking at that thing, I uh, say, well, should it be put in place? It's not exactly completely clear on both sides, but uh, we don't have the governor, lieutenant governor, or other members of leadership saying, just put the mandate in place. Yeah, the governor has been towing a very fine line on this. He has refused to be the one to say, I'm going to mandate you use this in public. He has now evolved through that saying, you know, any local municipality, city, county that wants to do that, come to us and we're going to go ahead and give you the green light. But all along, he's been very careful about not mandating mass mandates, but also, you know, during the shutdown, he was always taking the approach of we're going to give you the information and let you make that decision. So he is clearly taken from the very beginning. Uh, of this pandemic that he is not going to make mandates and uh, so I guess force the people of Utah to do certain things. I think this really exposes sort of the, the tricky territory that the lieutenant governor has to navigate, right? I mean, he, people want to know. He's a candidate. They want to know exactly where he stands on certain issues. Mask mandate is, um, you know, it's a key one for a lot of people. But on the other hand, he has to show allegiance to the person who is currently governor. So I, I somewhat sympathize with his position right now. Um, but gosh, you know, as a voter, I would really love to know where he stands on, on this really important public health issue. So, but Jen, so he did take a position with schools for example. Absolutely, yep. absolutely. But still, they're not all open. Uh, no. Even that hasn't changed that necessarily. You have a, th a thought about that? Because that seems to be a really hot spot in the state of Utah right now, as some schools are opening right now, and we have some, at least one Salt Lake School District that's not at all. It's so tricky. I mean, um, my kids have already aged out of the public school system, so actually I'm really happy I don't have to make this choice because it, it really is, um, you know, you look at the data. How, how safe will my child be? How safe are the teachers going to be? What sort of precautions can we put in place? And then once you get that first flare up, what do you do? So I, I do think that school boards and districts are really doing all that they can, but there's so many unknowns. I mean, I, I'm glad to see that a lot of districts are sort of following the science right now. This is this is the science right now. But sadly, you know, this disease is changing and we don't know all the ramifications. Uh, you know, I think parents and, and students and teachers are really in a hard spot right now. Mm -hmm. Glenn, you yeah, districts comment? can't win. Districts can't win no matter what they do. In Davis County, they rolled out the hybrid while they're, where they will have some in-person and some online. Granite School District is moving forward with in-person. And in each of those districts, you have people fighting over the exact opposite things. In Davis County, parents are wanting to go in-person every single day. And so the Davis School District is taking heat for that. In the Granite School District, they're saying, whoa, slow down. There's no need to rush in-person uh, classroom learning. And so no matter what move these districts make, they're facing backlash over it. Mm -hmm. That is well, true. Well, and, and there's, 
there's a lot of concern, I know, from talking to uh, legislative leaders yesterday about the special session, what reopening schools is going to mean for a possible second wave of the virus here in Utah. I, I had a couple of Republicans tell me that, hey, there's no question we're going to see more cases as a result of schools reopening. But, but they see it as inevitable, just like they see the economy reopening as inevitable. It has to be done. We have to try to live normally as much as possible. And yet, by doing so, are we going to increase cases again? And if we increase cases mm -hmm. again, we have, of course, the horrific health implications of that, but we also have the economic implications. Uh, people True. don't have jobs, they're not going to have income taxes to pay, they're not gonna have money to spend to bring in a sales tax, and we're gonna have trouble again with the state budget. Yep. Well, uh, we have to leave this one for a second because I, I have to take the last minute to talk about the uh, the presidential campaign. From our distinguished panel right here, how big of an addition is uh, Kamala Harris? Kamala Harris is, is 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 the one, right? I mean, she was the the natural pick, I think, from the beginning. She's tested. She performed very well in the debates. Um, she's shown that she doesn't shriek away from a fight, and that's what Joe Biden really needs. Nobody votes on the VP pick, but it's pretty exciting. It seems to have energized a lot of Democrats. Yeah, Glenn, is that true? How are Utahns reacting? Yeah, I think Utah Democrats are really liking uh, that pick from what I'm hearing overall. And the great thing about that is we are going to see that front and center right here in the state of Utah. Jason, of course, you know uh, the debate happening at the University of Utah in That's October right. between Vice President Pence and Kamala Harris. Yeah, it's becoming the biggest ticket in town. Thank you so much for your great comments today. I'm so glad we're back together. And thank you for your comments. And thank you for watching The Hinkley Report. This show is also available as a podcast on pbsutah.org slash Hinkley Report or wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you for being with us. We look forward to seeing you next week.